Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? So, a little bit of uh, tech hitches at the start, but it's not a conference unless we have that. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about international SEO. Oh, God, I can really hear my voice there. Um, it's a bit when you record your own voice and you're like, ugh. Ew. Um, I'm going to be talking about international SEO, particularly for 2014. So the, the biggest things that you need to think of for international SEO. Um, it's not really any big difference between international SEO and doing SEO from a te technical point of view. Um, but there are um, a lot of things that you have to consider before you kind of start off. So I'm going to go through three main things for this, and that's geotargeting, language, and link development, um, which is the three cores of getting it right. God, how loud is he? Um, so there are an estimated 8.26 billion web pages out there. Uh, the, the key thing is that there are different indexes for the different uh, countries. And we might all realize this, but yet we don't really think about, about it when we do SEO. So you need to help the search engines figure out which index you want to be found in. So number one, geotargeting. Geotargeting is making sure your website's indexed in the right geographical uh, index. So the, the kind of key options that you have is either using um, CCTLD subdomain or subdirectory, uh, using webmaster tools and hreflang. I'm going to go through these areas. Can I just have a show of hands and on how many would consider themselves as being very technical? Okay, so what I'll do is that um, I'm going through things quite quickly because I have, I have 80 slides in 30 minutes, uh, but I will be putting these slides up afterwards uh, and there are more links there that you can uh, hear more technical stuff about. So um, first of all, this is Google's kind of uh, view of uh, the, the key ways of doing geotargeting. Um, I would like to add straight away, don't ever do the URL parameters, so just completely ignore that one. And there's some pl uh, pros and cons for each, um, uh, each area. Um, country code TLD is the, the biggest indicator that you're trying to target a specific country. This is uh, TLD such as .fr. Now, for anyone that's trying to do um, SEO uh, in France, for example, it's a big advantage to have the CCTLD. Uh, this is because it is the biggest signal to Google that you are wanting to rank in Google.fr. It's not the only option, but I'm going to tell you why it's, it's so good. So if you have an office, or you will have in a relevant country, and it's a growing business, especially if you have a marketing budget, you should use a CCTLD. So you should buy the FR.de. It's really important that you buy them as soon as um, you realize that you will have an international business. Um, even if you're not going to use them straight away, this is really, really essential. Having a marketing department in a country and, and still using things like subfolder is a bit like living at home when you're 30. Um, if you have substantial amount of budget for these countries, CCTLD is by far the best, um, best way of doing it. Now, using subfolder is used probably more uh, than any other strategy when you do uh, uh, geotargeting. This is particularly on like sites like .com, .net, etc., and then you use folder.fr, um, uh, not dot, uh, .fr, but .fr or .de, etc., and those uh, different language versions of this. So there are some really uh, pluses with this, uh, specifically when you have a budget restriction and when you're starting off, having a subfolder is very valuable. So, in fact, if you're starting off a business and you know you've got to be international eventually, I would buy those CTTLDs, um, but start off with the .com, uh, with the subfolder, which makes it a lot easier to 301 redirect those specific um, folders to the new version when you launch your uh, specific website uh, with the CCTLDs. Sites that will never have local offices, I think, should always really have the, the, the .com and the folder structure. It's also a really huge benefit from a link uh, development point of view. If you're starting a new business and you're wanting to start off in three countries, for example, and you don't have a massive budget, um, you, it's, a, it's a great benefit to be able to, li uh, to generate links to that website and all of the different subfolders um, benefiting from that. So if that is you, then the subfolder is definitely the right idea. I really um, refrain from recommending wholly that you should go for a CCTLD or a subfolder, etc., because it all depends on your circumstance, and you really need to research that before you, you choose. 
Um, companies like e-consultancy, for example, they uh, use um, subfolder um, structure. Uh, they don't have uh, specific offices in different countries, but they're wanting to target a lot more countries with uh, their site. There are also a lot of big companies that do that. The one thing I would say, um, I know there's a lot of huge brands that are actually using subdomains. So, you know, I just said that I, I wouldn't uh, say wholeheartedly this is what you should and shouldn't do. I've got to contra contradict that now and say just don't use subdomains. Um, subdomains is kind of the middle way between using a CCTLD um, and, uh, uh, or a subfolder in terms of that it's cheap to do and you can have on different hosting, etc. But it has none of the benefit of all those links. So then you're just being really cheap and you're not getting any benefit. So uh, if anything, I would refrain um, unless there are really big case from it on a technical point of view. Like for example, if all your sites are made in different languages, especially if it's a Windows server and a, um, and a, a Linux service, etc., uh, then you might have to have them in subfolders, um, subdomains. But other than that, please try to avoid it. Webmaster Tools uh, is another way of uh, choosing where you want to target. So you can only do that if you have uh, a non-CCTLD domain, such as .com, .net, uh, info, etc. Um, and you can target in Webmaster Tools which country you want to target. So you have a .com, but your, your whole audience, everything that you want to sell, for example, is just in the UK. Then you can have a .com domain and choose the UK. The problem with this one is that um, you can really restrict yourself. The amount of sites where I see like, oh, we, we, well, our main target is the UK, so we'll choose the UK. But then you might be getting business from others or referring business and so on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Um, let me just turn that off. Um, so you need to... Um, so um, you really need to think whether that is the... Um, com this the definite um, um, restrictions you want to make because you could be in really bad trouble if you do. So um, I saw this guy from Google speaking uh, last year and he told me that 25% of sites had the wrong geotargeting settings. Hoo-ha! That's a lot of sites ranking in the wrong index and not even, um, they shouldn't even rank there. So be aware of that one. Um, has it, anyone um, who has heard of hreflang? So hreflang is a, 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 actually quite a technical um, uh, attribute that is uh, very SEO specific. So because there's not many people that have heard of it, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but for anyone that wants to know more about it, the slides will be up. So in general, um, it's kind of, it was created by Google, uh, in, particularly in order to be able to show you that you have uh, maybe uh, two identical websites in English um, that is targeting Germany, uh, sorry, targeting Ireland, UK, and maybe have a third version for the US. Now, a big problem that used to be is that people had um, had all of these sites all in English, and you had to make them so substantially different in order for Google not to uh, to think of it as a, a duplicate site. And uh, now that became a big problem. So this hreflang is really valuable for when you have this. Um, basically, uh, attributing that, creating that tag within your site can really help. There are also other um, uh, variations of when you should use the hreflang. Um, also, when you have... Uh, uh, you translate the template of a page, like you have everything around being the exact same and just variations in the, in, inside on different countries. So it's a very useful tag and I really recommend you read up on it. So I've got links there for a Google Guide on uh, using hreflang. I would say as a brief comment to use, um, if you can use it in the sitemap because it's a lot easier than to use it per page. Um, I would also like to mention this uh, tool that the MediaFlow created to make it easier to create uh, the hreflang, especially in the sitemaps, which is a brilliant tool and, and made the shortlist for the UK Search Awards uh, for tools. Um, so definitely look into that as well. Again, I will tweet these slides. Um, I would like to say, though, even if you use the hreflang in any of these geotargeting um, areas, it's not a way of ranking your site higher in any index. These are just signs. So um, if you're hoping that if by uh, contributing, well, putting in hreflang or um, uh, buying a .de, it's not going to help your site rank higher. 
language. So I'm originally from Norway, which is have this really weird um, accent that some people think is Irish. Um, Language is really important. I think everyone knows working in marketing that you should target women and men differently. Like when you watch TV at night, uh, anytime you watch anything that's remotely kind of girlish, you get like tampon adverts, uh, washing powder, all these kind of target things that are so specifically for women. Yet the amount of brands that don't um, think about this from language point of view. So you have to speak the language you are wanting to um, appear for. So if you want traffic from Germany, uh, it is Sprache expression, or if it's anyone German here, I'm so sorry. Um, funnily enough, the search engine also think that if you have German on your site, you're also trying to um, rank in Germany. So apart from this CCTLD, the biggest um, uh, point pointer for international SEO is obviously the language. You all might think, yeah, yeah, of course it is. Oh, I've got some examples for you. So um, again, um, this is another pet hate of mine. Don't directly translate. Don't use translation services in thinking you are doing international SEO. It very rarely works. Uh, and don't use Google Translate, no matter how good it is. At Verve, we have um, 21 people and we speak 13 different languages. We have specialized in creating um, a team that speak all the languages that we're wanting to, to uh, do SEO in. And that's a really big plus. So if you're wanting to get to number one in Germany uh, and you have an in-house team, hire someone German that gets SEO and is a good writer. Those are the, the key things. So don't use the big brands as, uh, as a guide because now I'm going to show you how badly wrong you can do when you don't do the language. So Nike. Um, I, I would probably say that most of you would, would know Nike, and Nike is really international known. So this is in Google Norway, and if you Google Nike in Google Norway, you're like, yeah, of course they appear for Nike. Then you start doing some keyword research, and yoga school is the Norwegian word for, for trainers. So Nike yoga school um, has a, a search volume uh, of about 720, which in, in Norway is actually quite high because it's 4.5 million people there. Um, so that's actually quite a high volume. Then you Google uh, Nike um, Yoga School, which is Nike Trainers. Nike is nowhere to be found. Nowhere, nowhere at all. In fact, some guy selling out of his living room is likely to rank in Norway for Nike Trainers. And then you go to Nike and you think, there's no way they don't have a Norwegian um, uh, site. So uh, you look on the Nike websites, uh, you find a subfolder for Norway that has all the tags and everything. It's on everything technically optimized. It doesn't have the language. Why bother with all those things if you haven't bothered with the language? So they might rank for Nike, but nothing else in any of those Scandinavian countries. They would probably say, well, it doesn't really matter for us. We, we get so much money anyway. But it just seems like such a shame. Um, another thing I want to mention is IP detection. So uh, I know it's a lot of big brands, again, that use IP de de uh, detection for being able to uh, specifically uh, forward people to the correct site. I would really be wary of doing that because there's so many variants and unless you have a really good kind of tech, um, tech uh, kind of programming of that IP detection, it could go wrong. So there are loads of uh, variations such as uh, what, which IP um, country the, the Google Spider is from and so on and so on. Instead, I would really recommend using a JavaScript overlay, basically a pop-up that makes them choose if it, if it detects that it might have a different IP. So don't force them. Um, even Google did this for ages and it was really annoying. You can never get to google.com and then they had this little link at the bottom. So the biggest part of it um, is once you've done the, the, the technical part, you've, you've got the right um, folders and you've got um, uh, all the language and you've done the keywords and everything, then it comes to the link development. Now this is the biggest part of it because link development and links from that specific country is a bit like your neighbor saying, yes, they live here. And that is still the most important part of ranking in any country. Yet for some reason they think, oh, we'll just translate the page and they will miraculously rank. But it needs to have um, links in that language, ideally from CCTLDs from that country. Like if you're ranking in Norway, ideally .no uh, links, although they're quite hard to come, come by. So I'm going to show you a few examples of things that we've done. 
So uh, in the last uh, year and a half, I think we've seen more uh, updates from Google than the last three years before that. So like obviously loads of panda da babies and, and penguin babies and all, the, all of that. The big thing has been the tightening of the linking algorithm, uh, the deep pages, unique content, over optimization and so on. Now the biggest thing is none of these algorithmic changes. The biggest thing is actually people's attitudes to link. How many people would agree on that, that works on SEO? No one, shit. Um, but that's true, like if you've ever done a, a link development or try to do outreach in your life, you will have seen a complete difference from this year to last year. A lot of people say things like link is, linking is bad, it will hurt your site, you should no follow everything, um, and it's become a lot harder. Uh, which is quite ironic, really, because it's called the World Wide Web because of the links, but anyhow. Um, so we need to do what we can with what we have, and we need to think smarter. Someone's falling asleep. Um, so when one door closes, another one opens. And we basically need to think more like attracting rather than selling. And this is, again, quite obvious, but I'll show you ex a few examples of how you could do, it, good, do that. Um, get blogging, number one. I think from any, um, anyone doing international SEO, this is probably the biggest win from a long tail point of view. Um, blogging can increase keyword reach and profile and make it a lot easier to do um, link development and outreach. Increase link equity, social equity, and so on. Blogging is still one of the most powerful um, areas to generate um, uh, and attract links um, on your site. And it's especially powerful in countries where competition isn't as high as in the, in the search results. So we do, um, currently, we do outreach in seven different countries in Europe. And especially in the Scandinavian market, it's totally different uh, to the UK. Also, Spain is a lot easier for rankings, especially on long, t long tail, because it's, it's, it's slightly different in how it's um, progress. So, um, example, um, for Norway, uh, we've, we've used link decks to show the competitors. So this is, again, this is showing like numbers of links, uh, but still it will give you an idea. So one kind of uh, a competitor for the same uh, client in UK had like 97,000, uh, while in Norway had 2,000 links. There's a lot less you need to make a, an impact. So for Expedia, in Denmark, we, we do a lot of blogging, uh, particularly for the long tail. And it doesn't need, you don't need to be using the Google Google keyword tool to really research every volume. In fact, in Norway and, and Denmark and Sweden, you're very unlikely to find any volume on those long tail. You have to use your head, your brain, to really think about what will have volumes. So this actually means uh, tips for romantic weekends in Rome. It's so weird, it, ha it hasn't got the E. It makes you want to change it. Um, and literally overnight, it was ranking for tips, um, romantic uh, weekend stay in Rome. And that might seem like really long tail, and you're like, of course they're ranking for that. Well, that's of course why you should be writing those kind of blog posts that people will, with titles that people will actually search for. Blogging can also make your outreach uh, a lot easier. So all of the, the, the writers that we have are professional writers that would also blog for the client. Um, how many of you are using REL Author? Okay, so REL Author for 2014 is the biggest um, uh, recommendations I can make from a blogging point of view. Because in a few years, it won't be about um, which site or which company you work for, but who you have writing for you. It will be about um, author rank as well as page rank. Um, not that anyone measures page rank on its own anymore. Um, so make sure that you implement REL Author. There are loads of good guides about how to implement it, and it's not difficult to do. So um, another way of generating links uh, through the blog is doing little campaigns. It doesn't need to be really difficult, but it needs to be good quality. So for Hotel Club, we created loads of different uh, mini awards around, blog, uh, around bloggers. Singapore is a really difficult destination to generate um, uh, links from because it's, again, a really small um, community and very few amount of sites um, to kind of fight for. So we created uh, a list of the, the best Sing uh, Singapore sorry, Singapore food blogs, um, and create a little badge. And this sounds very 2005, but badges still works. Um, and uh, we had, out of the five that we had, four of them included that badge and mentioned that they were, you don't need to ask for it. You did, literally just tell them that you have been mentioned and there is a badge. You never ask for it. If you ask for it, it means you think it's shit. 
So um, apart from the blogging, and I'm sorry I speak so fast, but I know I have a lot of slides, um, it's doing smarter outreach. Uh, we haven't done link development for, for a long time now. We're doing more things that are related to campaigns, create a bigger content that will get that bigger link. Um, I like to refer to it as, um, and, and excuse me ladies, this is, sounds a bit chauvinistic, but I, I compare it to uh, when you go into a bar and you're a guy and you see a supermodel. Very few guys will go up to that supermodel because they think, oh, they have no chance with her. But no one else is going up to her either. So in fact, you probably have a much higher uh, uh, conversion rate if you did talk to her. So we think the same with bigger sites. So we think the bigger the site is, the less likely they are going to be spammed to death by people wanting to place content. So we work harder on targeting those big sites to find what they're missing, what they need, and then we usually get those links. Um, so um, I'm going to go, just go through these. So. In Norway, we had the problem where, again, uh, Norwegian CCTLDs are really difficult to get by. So uh, in Norway, you have to have a company in Norway and you have to have something like 10,000 pounds in your account to be able to get a .no domain, which seems crazy. Um, so it's really hard to get those relevant sites to link to you. So we applied that supermodel um, theory and uh, thought, what is the best site that we can get for um, Expedia in Norway? Um, and we looked through all the sites that we wanted to target, and then we went through this one particular one and really researched what they had, what they were missing, and how we could help them. Um, so we targeted Visit Norway. Um, Visit Norway, so I'm originally from Norway, and one of the things I get asked for the most is like, have you seen the Northern Lights? And uh, like the amount of times, and literally I would think probably about 10% of the entire content of this site is about the Northern Lights. But they didn't have a visual representation or explanation of how it happens and so. So we created a, um, a good quality, well, we think, a good quality uh, infographic uh, for them before we even contacted them. Um, and, uh, uh, and with logos from Visit Norway and Expedia, and then uh, target them saying that we've created this. We will also uh, take care of the social media part of this, pushing it out, um, and every time that someone uh, links to it, we created an embed code. Every time someone links, uh, links to it using the embed code, it will link back both to Visit Norway and Expedia. It's basically thinking about how can we cooperate to get the best for both if you can figure that out, there's very little chance that they will say no. Um, in fact, what happened with that one is they asked for it in both in Norwegian and English, so we got two uh, placements. Uh, Twitter isn't very big in Norway, but Facebook is, is, uh, is rather big. So we got a lot of Facebook um, shares for it. And most importantly, we got another 15 links from that one campaign in addition to having one from the most authoritative travel sites in Norway. There are also little things like uh, competitions that still works really well. It's it just, again, pitching it the right way around to, to, to show that you will help them. It's not just like, would you like a, a free hotel? But you have to uh, pitch it in as that we would also help you um, uh, with the social of this. Because you have to use your strength. If you're good at that, then that will become a big selling point. Uh, the last campaign I want to share with you, and hopefully show you the actual video as well, is a campaign we did for Hotel Board, Hotel Board? God. Um, hotel Club called Skate Seeing. So um, they wanted to target a lot of uh, cities in, uh, in the UK, and we came up with this concept of uh, sightseeing on a skateboard. Skate Seeing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, the first one we did was Brighton on a skateboard. Uh, so we created this video, which I will show you now, if you haven't fallen asleep. Uh, let's see if we can make this happen. Yeah. No? Loading? Ugh. Oh, the Wi-Fi isn't good enough to show it. That's so typical. It's an internet marketing conference. Where's that, my techie? He's left. No. Oh. Okay, so it doesn't look like I can actually show it with more than two seconds at the time, which will leave us staying here for till tomorrow. So I've also shared this on Twitter, so you can watch it if you want to. But this campaign uh, is about two minutes uh, skateboarding video of, um, uh, of Brighton. It has um, generated a, cons a, cons 
a good amount of tweets and Facebooks. But again, using that embed code, we then targeted several sites, and we're just going to pause this, several sites um, uh, in the Brighton area. Um, and again, we don't sell anything. We just tell them about it. Um, and we even got some uh, news coverage um, and a lot of specific sites in Brighton, again, linking to that video, uh, embedding the video, and that's where we get the link. Uh, and that's been really effective, and we're now uh, developing the, the London ones and, and so on and so on. So this will become a, a bigger campaign after a while. So this is just to show you that there are um, a lot of things that you can do if you just use your brain and think about how we can help them, and especially when it comes to international SEO and going into new markets. But most of all, you have to speak the language, you have to do the ge geo-targeting, and you have to make sure that you uh, try to attract rather than sell those links. Oh, God, I'm knackered. Um, lastly, make it awesome or, or don't bother. Uh, that's it. So if we have any questions, I'm away for that. Have you got any microphone? No. He was there, there. Send it over. Um, if you've got a rel author tag yeah. um, and you're getting someone who's in-house to write a lot of content for you yeah. and they leave. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. What happens then? Okay, so this is the genius thing with the rel author um, tag is that most people with social media, they've always been really concerned that if they leave, they'd bring it all with them. Well, uh, right, with the rel author, it actually benefits you unless they really, they, they really don't want to be associated with your content anymore or you don't want to be associated with them. When they leave, if they go from your company to the BBC, for example, and they become a journalist and a writer, Anything that they write for the BBC uh, will then attribute in terms of the author rank of that to your content. Your content will increase in authority, not decrease. So in fact, it's beneficial if they do that. It's the only social media, and I don't often say good things about Google, the only time, uh, the only um, social media tool that really allows you to continuously benefit from their authority. But they have to keep associated with your... Yeah, website. so it's very unlikely that they will take that out because obviously they want to keep their authority. So if they deauthorize all those uh, sites that they've targeted, um, they worked with, with you, that will decrease their authority. So I, I think it's very unlikely that they would unless there'd been a big fallout or something. Okay. Any more questions? Go on, Justin. I have no idea how long I've been speaking. Uh, just another question with regards to rel author. Yeah. Um, if uh, you mentioned that that people's authority moves around with them, which I, I kind of get that. What about if people are blogging on sites that don't have rel author set up? How do you actually oh, yeah. go about obtaining uh, uh, obtaining that authority for you know like Moz, Moz for example? I think doesn't or didn't used to have rel author set up on them. I don't know if they have now. But well, then it's education. Although I probably wouldn't educate Moz on it. That would be weird. But um, you would educate them on all the benefits for them. So um, uh, a lot of our writers are writing for a lot of blogs on a continuous basis to, to build up their authority on specific subjects. Like I usually make people uh, blog about what they are interested in. So I have specific travel, travel bloggers, fashion bloggers, and so on. And so they, um, they will then try to um, educate the site, saying that if you implement this, this will benefit you because I'm also contributing to these. Like I'm contributing to the Huffington Post. So if you implement this, that will benefit your site. And again, that's usually when they go like, ah, that makes sense. So it's basically showing you're educating them with all your knowledge. Do we have to cut it there or? Yeah, any other questions? No. Fine, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the, um, the, the video. It would have been cool to show it to you, but it's actually uh, tweeted about now, hopefully. <laughs>